Okay, thank you very much, David. Right, I, my name is Kevin Corley. Um, I'm a specialist vet in equine internal medicine and critical care. And I'd like to talk today a bit about some of the issues I see in the horse industry and some of the technology we can use to address that, some of which we've produced, some of which other people are producing. So my interest in technology is old. Um, this is uh, a younger, handsomer version of me back in the year 2000 when I was doing my residency in the States and I was one of the first people to adopt uh, lithium dilution cardiac output monitoring for foals. I've always been interested in the interaction of technology and medicine and I've furthered that in a parallel career to my veterinary career. So what are the current challenges for the equine industry? And there's a number of them. One of the most pressing and one that's in the press a lot in the States at the moment is welfare. And the welfare comes from two issues. One is um, injuries and mortality of horses at the track. And it's especially horses during racing that the public are interested in. The, um, it's quite public if a ho horse um, breaks a leg or, or, or something at, at, at the racetrack. And the other um, part of this is the use of drugs in horses. And there is a difficulty in explaining to the public the difference between therapeutic drugs which are used for the welfare of the horse to help the horse, for example, a painkiller given for a colic, versus a performance enhancing drug, which might be the same painkiller given to mask a lameness or something and make the horse perform when maybe it shouldn't be. And so we need to be certain as a veterinary profession and as an equine industry that we're getting the message out about drugs uh, and their use and their legitimate use in racehorses, but also that we control very well how those drugs are given. We can audit completely where and when those drugs are given. And so there is a very good trail to go back to when questions arise. Okay. Meat was also a big challenge for the equine industry. Um, it is slightly died in the headlines, but it, it feeds back into both uh, similar issues. It's not only the presence of horse meat in packages sold as beef, but it's also that then drugs that we use in horses can get into that human feed, food chain and phenobutazone was the drug that got a lot of attention. But there are other drugs which are Annex 4 drugs which are not allowed in animals for human consumption, such as metronidazole. And we need a good audit trail for the use of those drugs. So not only do we need um, to... Um, skip back one, please. Um, yeah, uh, and go... Yep. Yeah. Not only do we need... Um, to know which drugs have gone in, but we need to identify which horses are going into the food chain and we need very good identification of horses. Okay. The next challenge for our industry, and of course one that I'm very interested in as a specialist in internal medicine, is disease. And very recently, back in February, um, there was a flu outbreak in the UK which interrupted racing for several days. There's constant cases of equine herpes virus 1 popping up in um, various jurisdictions, quite a few in the States recently. The neurologic form of equine herpes virus 1 is pretty important, um, can cause quite a lot of um, disease and death to horses. And then there are some exotic diseases which are 
knocking at our doorway. And we've got to remember that second to humans, horses are the animals that travel the most in the world. There's huge global trade in horses. There's huge global movement of horses. And that makes us particularly vulnerable to transmission of diseases between different countries. So one example is African horse sickness. And this slightly alarmist headline here, nine out of 10 Britain's horses could die if it reaches the UK. It's not that far off. It's our horses are naive and it is a very serious disease of horses. And here at the bottom, we have equine infectious anemia. Again, it's not in the UK currently. It is in parts of Europe. It's uh, been in Spain, Italy, Israel. Um, it's also uh, in the United States. And again, the transport of horses means we need to be vigilant for it and we need to watch out. Just going back to flu for a second, we tend to dismiss flu. Um, we've got a relatively well vaccinated herd. We tend to think of flu as a mild transient disease that disappears. And there was quite a few commentators when there was flu in the, uh, in the UK saying, it's, it's, just a, it's just a cold, it's just a virus. Why are we making such a fuss about this? If we go to the next slide, this is a fold that presented to me last week. Um, beginning of last week. Um, the, those of you who keep horses can see that this foal is breathing very fast and uh, with quite a bit of difficulty because its lungs are stiff. It's an eight day old foal and presentation and it has flu. And uh, this foal ultimately did not make it. Flu kills foals and in the Australian outbreak in 2007, there were a number of foals affected. It was a naive population and a lot of, uh, and, and quite a few foals died. We haven't really seen foals dying in Europe until this year. And this current strain of flu that's going through that caused the disruption to racing in the UK is now killing a small percentage of foals, but um, it is killing some foals. Uh, in, including this one. So, it, so not only is it an inconvenience, um, uh, it, it's also something that profoundly affects welfare of horses. Okay. So obviously for disease, there's three things we want to do. We want to detect it early. We want to detect early so that we can treat and separate animals which are diseased so that they don't spread the disease. We need really good traceability because, um, and we'll come back to this, if you have an animal that's affected, we need to know where it's been, who's it been in contact with very quickly. The quicker we can get that information, the better we can, spread, uh, we can limit the spread. And lastly, we need to think about prevention. And one of the facets of prevention is vaccination. So we'll look at some of those in more detail. So this is released this month from the New York State Agriculture and Markets. And it is biosecurity tips for horse shows. And one of the main things we do as a basic way to try and monitor for disease is temperature. And here is some advice on temperature for horses, um, for people attending new shows in New York, how to monitor the temperature in their own horse. Okay. The main way we've been measuring temperature t up to date is rectal temperature. The advantage is that it's simple. Um, you can buy thermometers at, at the chemist. They're about 10 euros. Uh, you get through a lot if you've got horses because uh, digital thermometers always seem to break, but um, they're, they're pretty easy to get. But there are some big disadvantages about rectal temperature. We ask trainers, um, and in some jurisdictions such as Hong Kong, they actually legislate that trainers need to measure temperature twice a day. If you think about a yard of 40 horses trying to measure every horse's temperature, 
I reckon that that is about one and a half to two man hours. You need two people because you're going around the sharp end of the horse. You're, uh, you need someone on the head and someone to go, go around to the um, back end of the horse to get the thermometer in. You also need someone, the thermometers um, take quite a long time. They only take about, the ones that are advertised are six or 10 seconds. That's only once the temperature's steady. And usually the average time is 30 to 60 seconds to get a temperature. So to catch a horse in its stable and go around and take its temperature takes at least a minute and probably longer for some horses. The other thing is that they're not, rectal temperatures are not as accurate as we think they are. And there's several reasons for this. One is that people are bad at it. People are put the thermometer in, don't have patience, it's time consuming, pull the thermometer out. It might end up in a ball of feces. Um, then um, the we have a normal range for horses, but it's actually not correct, as this paper from March this year shows. We, and I believe there was recent work in human patients as well, saying the traditional normal range for human patients is not correct. What we're learning is that each horse has its own specific normal temperature, and we should pay attention to a horse's own specific normal temperature. The other... The last problem with rectal temperature is it's not verifiable. And there's the possibility for human error. There's a temperature of 39.7 and someone writes it down as 37.9. And there's unfortunately the possibility for it takes time. It, it's a hassle to get temperatures. You're sent round to get a yard full of temperatures. You just write down 37.1, 37.2 for the difficult horses because it's difficult to get them, it's dangerous to get the temperatures, and people, that's human nature. It's worse with foals. Foals are even more difficult to get temperatures from, um, and a number of studs which are monitoring for rhodococcus and things try and get their staff to take temperatures from foals, and it doesn't happen. So next slide then. We've developed an app um, which works off new microchips. Um, these microchips are the Biotherm or TempScan microchips, which are produced by Destron Fearing, part of the Antelic group. And they, um, as well as giving the identity of the horse, give, have a thermistor in them and give the temperature. So next slide. So, in this app, we have identity of the horse from the microchip. We have secure sharing of notes in amongst the farm, records and observations. But we also have a complete record of temperatures. These temperatures, um, we not only graph or list the temperature, so that you can see the individual temperature for that horse. But also we list the highest temperature in the last seven days and we list the baseline morning and evening temperatures for that individual horse. So that the temperature you're getting can be compared to data for that individual horse. This is very quick to get the temperature take a scan of a chip, it's very quick, and it, it gets recorded automatically. So for um, a farm, it gets automatically synced to the owner's phone so they can see the temperature of every single horse, they can see who did the scan, they can see where, where they did the scan, they can see when they did the scan. They can also Get uh, it can also be used by authorities because it's verifiable. It's quick, it's easy, horse in isolation, you don't have to go around the dirty end and try and um, take a rectal temperature with a horse with diarrhea. And it's verifiable. 
there's the scanner transmits the temperature to the phone and the phone puts it in the database. There's no human transcription um, of the temperature. So we also get the location and when we're talking about disease control, traceability is extremely important, but also this is very useful for individual farms. Um, there's lots of farms which move horses between um, fields pretty often and if you scan a horse when it enters a new field you've got a record of the horse entering that field you know which field the horse is in um, if you also and some of our um, users ha have used our, our first version in this way you send someone to look at a horse and tell them they have to scan it you know exactly that they've actually gone and looked at that horse because it's verifiable. It's not, you can't say you've gone to a far flung field of the farm and looked at it when you haven't because there's a verifiable step there. Lastly, unfortunately with the, um, trend, with the difficulty in employing people on studs and yards, Recognition of horses is not what it used to be. We used to have old retainers in every stud and farm who knew every horse. And you say, go and give, you know, old Blossom um, a sachet of butte. They'll go to the field, they'll know exactly which of the chestnut mares is old Blossom and they'll give the, um, give the drug. Nowadays, we have transient staff in our studs, we, we, we often have language barriers in our studs, and at least it can be verified which horse has received um, which drug with our technology. The, um, the other thing that um, we're exploring with a number of animal charities, seeing my lovely horse rescue there, is this is another way of look keeping an eye on horses which have been rehomed. We can, there's, uh, this works with a number of different scanners and one of the scanners is uh, 45 Sterling and ask your clients, uh, ask your members who have taken a horse on loan to scan the horse, you know exactly where it is. You keep track of your horse stock automatically through the app, put in a temperature chip and you know some basic health information about that horse um, in, in the location, in a remote location, without having to go and visit every single horse. This is going back to traceability. This is 2007 Australia, and this is showing how quickly that spread. So it started in uh, Sydney in an isolation facility, went to a horse show in East Maitland, and then spread like wildfire. If the authorities in Australia, as soon as they'd identified it, had been able to identify every single horse that had been at that show in East Maitland, because they'd all been scanned in, and their current location, because it was m mandated that every time you move a horse, you need to scan them on and scan them off the lorry, then we'd have much easier response and it wouldn't have cost them one to two billion Australian dollars. In the disease prevention field, we've also done some other apps. This is an app we produced for the Horse Race Betting Levy Board and National Trainers Federation. And uh, I'm just showing the pictures from the flu part of the app. This lists a, a variety of diseases and gives people information on identification uh, and prevention and, and for racehorses, the rules around racing, um, whether it's notifiable, etc. Et um, this is something we produced as a service for them. They've um, advertised it themselves and they have um, almost 10,000 users of, of, of the app to date. So the last strand of disease I talked about is vaccination. 
And this actually begins to tie in with the first two strands as well. So for welfare meat we need welfare disease and meat we need to know which horse it is and we need some information about what it's received. So actually knowing which horses have received which drugs is important for fair competition but it's also important for welfare of animals during competition and um, this sorry you itchy trigger finger there uh, one more one forward from there please this um, drug here is osphos which is a bit a drug which is used for bone repair in horses and is the um, is the drug that in Santa Anita has been implicated as a possible cause of the increased um, ho horse injuries in in the last year what so what we'd like to know is exactly which horses that's gone into and when and and the company would be very supportive in that as well because their instructions are don't give it to horses less than three and a half years old so it would be in their benefit if it's not misused because if it's continually misused then they may not get to continue to sell it for vaccination we have an issue and where we vaccination currently relies on a signature on a piece of paper um, and a handwritten date a handwritten lot number and a handwritten signature on a piece of paper for meat we want to know exactly which drugs have gone into the animal to see if it's suitable for processing for human consumption or not and all of these rely on accurately ah, you really I think I might fire you in a second <laughs> you need one more press it's my builds which are confusing you um, you accurate what we need is accurate record of administration of drugs or vaccination to an individual horse in a verifiable way so what I'm going to talk about today is the individual horse part of that the other part of that is something that my company is actively pursuing but I'm not going to talk about that further today okay so this is the original version of um, Equitrace which is currently available in the App Store and Google Play Store and it's based on horse identification via the microchip there are some the microchip is currently our strongest way of identifying horses and there are some really great benefits to it it can be automatically identified it can be um, it, it's implanted in the horse so it's difficult to remove and uh, replace um, we've occasionally seen infections around microchips and had to take the horse to surgery and try and remove it and it's actually pretty difficult to find the thing even when there's an abscess around it to help you so it, it is people imagine that there are people digging out microchips of horses that is no mean feat to dig a microchip out of a horse it is tricky there there are some issues around people may be placing microchips fraudulently in horses and the, the temp scan biotherm microchips are a great solution for that because although it, it is relatively easy to purchase um, normal microchips and code them it's virtually impossible to purchase temp scan microchips it's virtually impossible to make them in a factory in somewhere and you know if you get two temperatures which vary in that microchip you know it's a genuine temp scan microchip and you know it's 
a genuine article, and the cost of producing that f would not be worth the cost of horse meat, for example, for fraud. So there's huge advantages of that microchip for, for, for that purpose as well. Okay. Because microchips aren't absolutely 100%, they're usually backed up by markings, and um, yep, yep. I don't love markings. Um, this is an app we produced for Equine Veterinarians Australia which has a markings module in it, automatically fills in your, your, some of your markings, helps with markings. Um, it's very easy to produce electronically. The problem with markings, and maybe why we need electronic solutions, is that vets are terrible at drawing, uh, myself included. So on the, here we have um, the horse, and here we have the representation in the passport of that horse. And so, when we're talking about electronic solutions for markings, I don't think we need to get too hung up on every white hair properly being represented in the electronic solution, because anything is better than the current system. We are so far off accurately recording the markings of horses in our passports currently. And hands up, I didn't go to art school. When I fill out a passport, I'm not good at it either. So I think this strengthens the use of the microchip because other solutions, such as, uh, and again, biometric data for identity, we don't have yet. We're, we have a side project in the company looking at different options, looking at all of this, but it's just not there yet. And for example, iris scan sounds brilliant, except for if you're the poor vet who has to try and get an iris scan off a yearling thoroughbred, which is head shy. Um, it's just, it just doesn't fit the nature of the beast. You can tell a human to look into a camera and get an iris scan, trying to get these things from horses is just not possible. There are other things you can look at. Um, skip that one, please. Um, oh, okay, then. We'll, we'll just go back. Yeah, perfect. And then we'll go. Um, there are other things we can look at, like things I'm interested in are trying to recreate face ID for horses. Um, look at the three, 3D topometry of, of the horse, um, the physiognomy of the horse, try and model the horse with both white marks and um, 3D. But it changes with time, it's harder. Uh, horses are more uniform than humans and we're, we're not there yet with technology. We, we will be but at the moment we're, we're left with a humble microchip. The last thing about the microchip is there's 20 years worth of horses with microchips in them. And any solution we have, even if we develop a fantastic microchip that replaces them today, is not going to be retrofitted to 20 years of horses. So we have to work with current technology today. And that's why we're working with the microchip at the moment. Skip this one. On drugs, the other aspect we're doing in my company is giving vets advice. And so this app, um, Equine Drugs, has been available since 2010. We've got over 6,000 users worldwide. And if you, it, if you press the button, it lists over 700 drugs, um, gives people information, allows them to calculate out the dose, gives notes and references for the dose, and then gives information on competition rules. Um, and it's updated monthly um, with information. Um, this app is available for people to purchase on subscription. It's also available for members of British Equine Veterinary Association, 
equine veterinarians Australia um, and, and it was available for a while in the UAE um, in an app produced by Boehringer. So to come back to my theme of current challenges for the equine industry, we have welfare, disease and meat and right in the middle of them is the vet, um, not that vet. <laughs> but together with the vet, in order to enhance this, we need data. And in order to gather data, we need technology. So what we're looking at is ways of providing technology to vets to gather data to enhance the welfare of horses. Um, one thing I'll say about this connection of vet data and technology is over 10 years of producing apps for vets, I've learned it's maybe not a natural marriage. Um, vets, learning to design UI, UX for vets is maybe different from learning for other people and there's lots of tricks we've had to learn to help my more Luddite colleagues um, uh, adopt technology. Thank you very much. Sean Harrington from My Lovely Horse Rescue. Just the foal that died from the flu, was the mare vaccinated and when had she had her last vaccination? She was in race training with a very well-known trainer until 2016. I assume she was vaccinated during that entire period. Till the end of 2016, she was in race training. Um, I don't have information after that, but I assume that there was a lapse in vaccination. Just on the chips um, for the uh, for, for doing the temps and stuff, because sometimes we'd have about forty temps a day, like yep. forty in the morning, forty in the evening. Um, so with the with these chips, obviously the the chips that are already in the horses have to stay. Yep. Can you put a new chip in, and is that could that be registered as the horse then? Yes. I can. And yes. Okay. Um. <laughs> Okay. We have clients who've double chipped their horses. They've generally put the biothermo chip in the right hand side of the neck. Um, the app can tell the difference between the two chips. Um, we allow up to three chips currently in our database per horse because a um, surprising number, we have Goffs as a client, for example, that they use our app to identify horses coming through and a surprising number of horses are double chipped already um, when they hit the sales ring. Maybe one or two percent are already double chipped, so we allow up to three chips in our database per and, horse. And what is the, can you say, the approximate cost of the chips? The chips themselves are a similar price to normal chips. Okay, um, I, I can come and talk to you about specific pricing afterwards. Hi. Yep. S sorry, it's the My Lovely Horse Show rest, uh, show, and th then we'll come to you. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, Emma from My Lovely Horse. Um, just in relation to you saying know your own animals' um, yep. temperatures, in relation to these microchips, let's say I have a foal and it's not microchipped until it's 30 days old, yep. can I manually input what their temperature has been before uh, the microchip goes in so it's on the database? Um, or is it just from the day it's better? from the chip currently because that's the verifiable data um, we are always listening to customers and changing the app to include other features that customers like so so there's always possibilities to uh, update for allow we'd probably if we were entering manual data would probably put it in a different part or at least start so because two things one rectal temperature and biotherm microchip temperature are not always identical 
the biotherm microchips are completely internally consistent. So if you know the normal temperature for that animal with a biotherm chip, you can detect even small fevers. But because, a, because rectal temperature is not 100% accurate either, they don't, they usually within a degree of each other, almost always within a degree of each other, but they're not always identical because they're measuring temperature in two different parts of the body. So, um, do you supply a specific type of RFID reader for your chip? S -s Sorry, just go again. For the for the Equitrace temperature chip. Yes. Is it a specific type of RFID reader that has to be used for a temperature chip? There are four different RFID readers that. Um, currently work with our app and the temperature chips. They vary in price from 45 um, sterling, so about 50 euro, to around 450 euro. Um, obviously, if you buy a very powerful one, it's very, very quick to acquire the chip. If you buy the cheap one, sometimes you have to hunt a, t a little bit if the chip is deep, you, you get what you pay for. And in terms of connectivity, so you were saying how um, you can have somebody at the yard scanning your horses while you're away. You know exactly where the horse is and temperature and whatnot. Yep. How is that um, data transmitted? So it's encrypted on the phone, transmitted to our database, encrypted, and then is uh, shared with authorized users on the farm um, to their phones. So is there like a, is there a link between the RFID reader like via Bluetooth to your personal phone? Correct. And into a cloud? Correct. And just uh, to the exactly for the chip, how is the chip powered, and what's the lifespan? So of the, the chip? they're passive chips, like the normal RFID chips. Um, sorry, the question was how, how is the chip powered? These chips um, and that they're, they're they're produced by a, a, a commercial manufacturer in the states. Um, they are um, passive. Um, their, their lifespan is the lifespan of the horse. Um, they're actually made from the same materials as the current chip, um, in the same casing as the current chip, by the same manufacturer, um, I think largely in the same factories. So um, there's very little difference from the current chip. They're one millimeter longer, they're the same diameter, and they're passive silly question but how, how does it actually you know um, gather the temperature information um, that, that the temperature um, is, is patented technology uh, I, I'm sure you and I can look up the patent at some point but it's patented technology and, and I believe you know why, why it's interesting for fraud is it took them a long while to develop it's not it's not something anyone could, could make in in their back garden. And just one final question on that, if, if you know. Um, is there like a, a range of tolerance? So, because I um, spent a lot of time taking temperatures on horses, and when you actually read a lot of those temperature um, monitor thermometers that you buy in the, in the pharmacy, you know, the, the range of tolerance or, or the, you know, how off it can be, can be as much as two degrees here and there. Sure. So, the, uh, the question was about the, the range of accuracy of the chips. The, the chips, I believe, are plus or minus 0.1 degree. The, but that's actually, the horse's temperature varies more than that. That's why we give morning and evening temperatures, because there is a diurnal variation in the temperature of the horse. And that's why we graph it, we give uh, baseline morning and evening temperatures and average temperature and highest temperature in the last seven days to give you the most possible information about the temperature because it's too simplistic to think this horse has a normal temperature of say 37.3, 38.0. It, it's not actually the way biology works and so that's why I think a a graph that gives you that information for the individual horse. Some horses will vary more than others, and you can take that into account when interpreting the temperature of the horse. 
in, we are gathering data and we will produce um, alerts in, in a future version based on individual horse variation. So if the horse varies very little, you'll get an alert at a lower threshold than a horse that varies more. Just, just one more final question. So um, you're putting the, the chip in the neck where the normal RFID chip goes. Correct. Um, and we have found that by taking rectal ter uh, temperatures, it's not often indicative of like a real core temperature of the horse. Have you tried um, testing the chip in different locations? And if you have, have you found a variance in temperature out of those locations? Again, the chip isn't my technology. There has been research done in France and I can sh uh, share, share that uh, research with you um, after this. There's, there's um, a paper just about to be published, um, which I've seen the impressed version of, and there is information on that. So, what you want for a biological test like that is internal consistency. It actually wouldn't matter if, and that isn't the case for these chips, but say you had a chip or a, a temperature meet reading thing that always said 20. That as long as it's consistently 20 for that horse when it's well, and as soon as it has a fever, it's 21. That's useful biological information. You want the most important thing about any biological measurement is that it's consistent uh, and that cl clinical changes in the animal are reflected by changes in, in the reading uh, and these chips 100% give that. We could do that electronically, a calibration. But it's actually unnecessary because, as I say, they're internally consistent for the individual horse. As long as you are, and that's what you should be doing anyway, as long as you're comparing data from the individual horse to that horse, you know where you are. Thank you very much. It's been very good. I'm a consultant pediatrician. That we have a lot of similar information we've been doing for children. You know, for example, Two per 1,000 children die unexpectedly, so-called cod deaths. There have been a lot of research to see what are the reasons and what can predict cod death. One of the most important things is we also did temperature in babies, regular temperature, parents were asked to do and they kept record. We ask parents to weigh the babies every day after breastfeeding, every day. And those babies who do not put on weight in the expected way were at risk of dying. So weighing is an, another biomarker you might be interested in. And the same chip can actually record it. And if a horse or baby is not gaining the gaining weight correctly or certainly losing weight two days in a row, something is brewing. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have had a request from one of our studs to add weight and we are currently researching Bluetooth connected weigh scales to see if we can do it automatically. There is for some of our customers a price issue with weigh scales that um, will limit their use, unfortunately, but I am a great believer in weighing animals as well. Why isn't this everywhere? Why isn't a country forward country like, say, Hong Kong put this in all their horses? What? Watch this space. What sort of predictive models will create out of this and how will we train the future veterinary professionals to be able to predict when disease happens, before it happens and instilling confidence into owners that we're actually making valid predictions that obviously they never see the sickness. It'd be fantastic for the rescue charities, wouldn't it? So on the um, last slide you, you saw the word data and that's very important to us. Um, at the moment, we are collecting anonymized data on this. So automatically, um, if the person opts in, we are getting um, 
the temperature of the horse, the signalment of the horse, a one-way encrypted version of its ID. So we have no idea who the horse is, but we know if uh, multiple measurements are made on the same individual horse. The longitude to zero decimal places, the latitude to zero decimal places. So we know the horse is in an area kind of twice the size of the state of Delaware. We've no idea which individual farm it's on, but we know a vague geographic area of the globe that it's in, and we know the local temperature conditions from an um, open weather temperature site. So we, are use, so we are collecting big data on this uh, uh, as the app goes out, if our users opt in. Yep. Um, you mentioned about facial recognition in horses. Uh, I was just curious about where you see that technology going. How would you use it? What behaviours would you monitor if you did have it? Um, I think the the it would have to be pretty robust. Um, the some of the limiting factors that we found in our uh, uh, initial pilots are lighting conditions because it's unfortunately the lighting conditions in stables can be very very poor when we're talking about trying to recognize a horse going into the sails suddenly they go from bright sunshine in, in the pre-parade ring down into a dark tunnel down into the um into the sales ring at what point do you try and grab them it can be very so it would be great to be able to 100% reliably recognize horses throughout their life via um, something that's remote and just, ha but the, the limitations we've looked at so far are cost. Like, do you have uh, multiple cameras on every gate in your farm to identify when they go through the gate and on every back of every lorry you have, etc. Uh, it, it, it would be very exciting if we could do it off cheap technology like a smartphone. But at the moment, it's too limited to get there yet. Maybe you'll tell us differently. Hope so in the future. <laughs> we have a question. 